Well, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 32. Jesus Christ came into the world to save that which was lost. Matthew eighteen eleven. Jesus Christ came into the world not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, 13. Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and save that which was lost. Luke 19.10, Jesus Christ came into the world not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9.56, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. 1 Timothy 1.15, and so it's clear for us to see that the mission of Christ Jesus was to save sinners. He came into this world to save sinners. And those he saved, he sends out to save others through the gospel. Jesus said, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age and he sends us because there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name given um, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved acts 4 12 and so in our study of the gospel of matthew we are in chapter 9 if you can turn to chapter 9 our verses comes from verses 9 to 13 rather And this morning we will see really three mission aspects um, that we can learn from. Mission aspects drawn from the mission of Christ to earth. So three mission aspects that we should learn from. And the first one was Christ's call of Matthew, Christ's concern for the lost, and Christ's critique of the Pharisees. So let me read for us Matthew 9 from verse 9 to through 13. And Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, They said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not to those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let me pray for us. Father, we we come, Lord, before you. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, your word that is ever true. Lord, and you have given your word to us for our instruction, Lord, for our edification, Lord, for our exhortation, for our consolation. And so, Father, I pray that through the ministry of your spirit, you would apply your word to our hearts today. Lord, that you would Shine the light of your word into our hearts that we may know and see who we are and what we are like, Lord, to recognize that which you desire us to change, to strengthen that within us that that is weak, and Lord, to embolden us even further in that which is strong. And so help us in that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the first sort of mission aspect that we can learn is from Christ's call of Matthew. It says that Jesus went on from there. And that is, of course, from there is the the house where he healed the paralytic. Uh, And we read from from Mark that he was uh, walking on the seashore of, uh, of, of Galilee, and there was a great number of people who followed him, and he was still teaching them. 
Uh, and then he saw a man named Matthew. Now, Mark referred to him as Levi, the son of Alphaeus, and Luke calls him Levi, the tax collector. And it, so Matthew, Levi, it's the same person. It could be that he had two names. Uh, as, as some of the other disciples we know uh, or suspected had two names, like Thomas was also called Didymus, and, and Nathaniel was called Bartholomew. And so G, or it could be a second name, or it could be a name that Jesus gave him. Um, remember Simon Peter's, Simon's name was changed to Peter, and later on Saul was changed to Paul. And so Matthew really means a, a gift of God. And so him being a tax collector and therefore a literate man was indeed going to be a gift of God to Christ and his ministry and mission in the writing of this very gospel. Uh, it is interesting that Matthew wrote a whole gospel, but there is not a single word recorded of him in all of Scripture that is attributed to him. Uh, and, but of course, he is, has written for us the, the, the gospel. Uh, and then it calls... It says that Matthew was a tax collector. He was sitting in a tax booth. Uh, now, the Roman government exacted taxes from those over whom they ruled. And uh, they would appoint a chief tax collector over a, over a region. And he would in turn employ uh, local people who knows the other people and knows the trade routes and, and the happenings and going on and, and he would entrust them then to collect the taxes. Now we read, you may remember Zacchaeus, the little short tax collector who climbed a tree. Uh, he was actually a chief tax collector over a whole region of Jericho. Matthew was one that collected taxes at a tax booth. And uh, one of the commentators, William Barclay, reported that there existed three main statutory taxes. Uh, there was a, a land tax, which was about one-tenth of the grain that you would produce from that land, or one-fifth of fruit and grapes. Then on top of that, there was an income tax of about 1% of a person's income. Then there were also a poll tax that was levied on males from 14 to 65, but also from women from 12 to 65. On top of that, there were duties and excise, anything from 2.5% to 12.5% that was levied on imported and exported goods. Uh, there were taxes for using main roads. There were taxes for crossing bridges. There were taxes for entering market towns and using harbors. There were taxes on packed animals and taxes per axle on your carts. So almost like today, many taxes to be paid. Uh, and of course, they would set up these tax booths at all the major trade routes and where they intersect. And that is where Matthew's tax booth was in Capernaum, where there was a conversion of a number of, of routes. Uh, and, um, you know, a tax collector would earn his profit, or make his money by overcharging the taxes. He would ask more than what was due. And of course, this made them very popular and well-loved among the nations. Um, but the Jewish people were, 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 were resentful that the Romans would rule over them. Um, and therefore, paying taxes to Rome was a little bit of a chafe to them. There was, it was, they were not too happy about it. Furthermore, because this tax system was so open to abuse uh, by those who collect the taxes on behalf of Rome... Uh, tax collectors were despised people. And especially if they were one of your own nation, they were even more despised. Uh, they were considered to be greedy and corrupt. The rabbis would call them robbers. And they were considered unclean because they mixed continually with Gentiles. They were often uh, were forced to work on a Sabbath. And so they were considered defiled, unclean, basically sinners. And so that was Matthew. Matthew was lost. Matthew was unacceptable to his countrymen. He was unacceptable politically, uh, viewed as a Roman sympathizer, 
or a collaborator, uh, probably also distrusted by the Romans because one way of making money is to take more from one and pay less to the other. And so he was probably uh, distrusted by his ro- the Roman overseers. He was religiously unacceptable, being ceremonially unclean and guilty of prostituting himself to Rome. And so he would have been barred from the temple or from the synagogue. Uh, He was also socially unacceptable. Uh, Matthew would have been ostracized from his people, from his community. Uh, None of his people would have uh, been allowed to do business with him, uh, to travel with him, to take aid, receive aid for him, or actually give him any aid. No one was allowed to host him in their home, nor were they to be guests in his house. So Matthew was was lost. He was unacceptable, beyond redemption, beyond hope by those around him, but not to Jesus, not to Christ. Uh, And so we read here that Jesus walked by him and called him saying, follow me. Follow me. And so the first aspect that I want to highlight for us about what we should learn, that we should take note of, and that we should see and do, is that Jesus actually called Matthew. He actually spoke to him. He he, he commanded him to follow him. And not just for a while, not just for a little bit, for the rest of his life, the, the, the actual commandment to follow him is, a, is, an, is an imperative, uh, a present, active, indicative, which means it's ongoing. Follow me and keep on following and don't ever stop following me. And so I'm sure Jesus, as we know from other texts, that Jesus was a man of prayer. And I'm sure that he has prayed for Matthew's salvation many a time. He prayed for him to come to faith. He prayed for him that Matthew would repent and, and follow him. And we should pray for people to come to follow Christ. We should pray for their repentance and their faith. That is absolutely necessary. But at some stage of equal necessity is you have to talk to the person. You have to command them To repent and believe. You have to actually call them to follow Jesus. And perhaps you have on your heart someone that you have a strong desire that they should come to faith. You may be thinking of that person right now. There may be a family member, a friend, a work colleague, a neighbor. And you have been praying fervently for their salvation. And that is good and that is right. But have you actually talked to them about the gospel? Have you explained the gospel to them? Have you called them to repentance and faith? Called them to follow Christ? That is essential for someone to come to salvation. And so if you are the one the, who the Lord has impressed upon your heart to pray for someone, you are most likely also the one that he wants you to go and tell him or that person about Christ. And so that is the first thing. He, Jesus walked by and said, follow me. And what happened? Lo and behold, Matthew got up and he folded him. Now, there... This, these few words are just packed to the brim with doctrine, the doctrine of salvation. We read a few words, but there is so much that had happened to bring Matthew to this point where he would get up and follow Jesus. Uh, and I believe Matthew was converted at this time or maybe shortly before. And Scripture tells us that Man is dead in his trespasses and sin. 
spiritually dead towards God, unable to respond to Him. Scripture tells us that there is no one righteous, no one who understands, no one who seeks after God, no one who does good. All have turned aside, have wandered away from God, and therefore have become useless to God. In Romans 3, verse 10 to 12. Scripture teaches us that before Christ, you and I and Matthew and were helpless, hopeless, unable to save ourselves. And no amount, no quality of good words or quantity of good words could have made us perfect or acceptable to God because He desires and demands perfection. And Matthew was not perfect. And so scripture also teaches us that sin alienates us from God, places at enmity with God, separates us from God, makes us hostile towards God. And so it is unlikely for Matthew, just out of himself, to get up and follow Jesus. Something had to happen. And scripture tells us that It's only those who are foreknown by God, that who are predestined by God, who are called by God, justified by God, and ultimately glorified by God. And this was all decreed by God before the creation of the earth. Matthew's salvation was decreed before the foundation of the earth. Furthermore, Scripture tells us that no man can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. John 6, 44. Read further that it is the Holy Spirit that convicts a person of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. All requirements to repentance and faith. It requires a work of the Holy Spirit to have convicted Matthew. Furthermore, it tells us that repentance is granted us by God. Second Timothy 2.25, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Then we also read that faith, faith is a gift from God. For by grace you have been faith through, uh, saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. Then further we read that to be right with God, you need to be justified by God. And that is granted to us by faith. And then we have peace with God. We have been reconciled with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 And for when that has happened, we are regenerated. We are made new. We are born again from above. Matthew was made new. Second uh, Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Matthew was born again, born from above, as Jesus explained to Nicodemus in John 3. Salvation is a work of God. And all of this took place around those two words, follow me. And then, of course, man has a responsibility in salvation. Man needs to respond to the call of God. Man needs to repent and believe. It's like the, 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 another tax collector which Jesus used as an illustration in the parable on, on, on prayers where, where he cried out to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That is an act of repentance. I am acknowledged that I am a sinner and I need your mercy, Lord. And then, of course, he needs to exercise his faith. He needs to believe. He needs to believe in Jesus Christ. To be saved is you need to confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved, Romans 10, 9 tells us. Now it is very likely that Matthew 
living in Capernaum and Jesus being stationed there for his ministry in the, in the, around the Sea of Galilee, that he had heard Jesus taught before. He'd heard his teaching. He heard or have seen his power to heal, his power to cast out demons. But it was not until this moment that Jesus came up to him and called him and says, follow me. And what did Matthew do? He got up and followed Jesus. Matthew's faith had action. Matthew's faith had works. Matthew's faith obeyed the Lord. And his faith counted the cost. Luke tells us that he left behind everything. So one moment he is sitting at his tax booth, with maybe all the, the taxes collected, and he got up and he left. He followed Christ. He left behind his old life. He committed himself wholeheartedly to Christ. And of course, leaving his old life behind had spiritual consequences. He had to leave behind all his, his greedy, selfish, devious, fraudulent practices. The selfishness which caused him to take from others so that he can get what he wants. And of course, there were also material consequences. He forsook his wealth giving up a lucrative position that would have had grave implications for his financial security. Uh, not only in giving up the position, but also for his future, his future prospects. Because you see, if you're a fisherman and you follow Jesus, if this thing doesn't work out, you go back to fishing. But if you're a tax collector and you walk away from your position... They will never receive you back again. Nor would anyone really want to hire an ex-tax collector uh, if, if, if you are looking for employment later on. But he entrusted himself wholly to Christ. His future belonged to Christ. And this was not done reluctantly or begrudgingly, but joyfully. I mean... Really, the joy of one's, over one's salvation, I mean, the joy over spiritual matters is, is a fruit of the Spirit. And it, it, it's a sure sign of salvation that has come to your heart. If you are overflowing with joy, nothing is a sacrifice when you have tasted grace. And so Christ's call evoked great joy in him. Inexpressible joy, as Peter would say. And Matthew held a party. He organized a banquet, a celebration. And who was the guest of honor? Christ. Jesus, his Savior. Christ, his King. The Lord, his God. And Matthew really is he's so humble. Here in Matthew, he does not even mention that it was the banquet was held by him or in his house. But it says, behold, look, would you believe it? There, all Matthew's friends were with him at this banquet. Now, of course, he did not have good, holy, and righteous friends. He only were mixed, he was only allowed to mix with the riffraff of society. And so all his other political, social, and religious outcast friends were with them. All those who were unacceptable, excluded, untouchable in one sense. A great crowd of them, Luke tells us. And really, as I said, a telltale sign of true conversion is the need, the urge, the, the desire, the joy of telling others about Christ. What, who He is and what He has done for you. And so He would have told them about the Lord's amazing grace to Him. He would have told them about His deep love for him. He would have told them about uh, how wonderful and marvelous it is to be forgiven by him. He would have told them about his liberating power that he now has, are no, is no longer a slave to sin, but now can be a slave to righteousness. And that Christ has changed me. He's given me a new hope, a new heart, a new outlook on life. 
And so this is what I believe he would have told his friends. He says, friends, if you can just imagine that for a moment, friends, let me tell you about Jesus and his amazing grace. He saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but behold, I live. Friends, let me introduce you to Jesus. He's calling you, my friends, to repent and believe in him. To be the savior of your soul. To be the king of your heart. To be the Lord and the God of your life. And people, we, we cannot make someone a Christian. We cannot make someone believe. But we can bring them to Christ. We can introduce them to Christ. We can call them to repent and believe. We can call them to follow Jesus. We must call them to follow Christ. And so we see from this first mission aspect of Jesus is that we need to speak. We need to call those who are lost to follow Christ. And that, of course, would, would be born from the second aspect, which is Christ's concern for the lost. I mean, Christ's mission was to save the lost, and we see this in his, this concern that he has for the lost, a deep concern for the lost. I mean, he came preaching the gospel, the gospel of, of the kingdom, Matthew 4, 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. He was there proclaiming the gospel. And of course, this concern for the lost led him to, to go to, to those who are lost, to those who are unacceptable, to those who are excluded. And it led him to Matthew, and through Matthew, it led him to all Matthew's friends. And so Matthew held this banquet because he wanted to share his joy. But most of all, he wanted to share Christ. He had a heart, he had compassion for his friends, for their salvation. Who were lost sinners like himself, excluded from the society, riffraff of the society. And so Matthew, upon salvation, received the same heart. He shared the heart that Christ had for the lost. And therefore he had a deep concern for the lost, which caused him to act, to invite. And we see the Pharisees, where Jesus and disciples attended this this, this banquet, and then we read of the Pharisees next that that was presumably after the banquet that they have uh, cornered the disciples and said, "Hey, what is your what is your teacher doing? He's mixing with literally with the riffraff of society." Um, and before they 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 accused him of blasphemy, now they are accusing him of of questionable morals. They attack his morals. They say, listen, for someone who associates with people like this, it's probably because they want to be like them. They probably are like them. And how can you follow someone like that? This is, he's unworthy to follow. He can definitely not be the Christ. And Jesus overheard their criticism. And then he gave them his critique. But before we look at that, I need to ask us a question. I need us to examine our own hearts. Do we have a heart for the lost? Was Christ's heart for the lost transplanted into us when we came to salvation? Do we love Christ and the things that he loves and care about? And I'm not talking about you, when you come to salvation, all of a sudden you're a quiet introvert, and the next moment you are this loudmouth, extroverted, evangelist extraordinaire. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, do you have a deep-seated desire in your heart 
for the lost to be saved? Does it cause you to pray? Does it prompt you to speak? Does it move you to action? And perhaps this morning you find yourself that the fire in your furnace for the lost, which once burned hot and strong in your heart, have become, if you're honest, a little bit less intense. It's been doused down a little bit. It's almost burned out. And so how do we rekindle this concern for the lost? How do we fan up the embers of our passion for the lost up into flame again in our hearts? And I think the first step would be to confess it, to recognize it, to acknowledge it. To confess to the Lord our indifference. You know what indifference is? I don't care. I don't care if they go to hell. I don't care if they struggle through life without Christ. It's really a lack of love. And so we need to confess that if that is true of us. And we need to revisit the cross. Revisit the gospel. Remember the first time you tasted grace. That, that moment when you understood that you are forgiven, that you are accepted by God because of Christ. Nothing in you has changed. I am still this sinner, and yet, because I have put my hope and my trust in Christ, He now has changed my heart. He has now wiped my sin away. He's now made me new, different. And so remember the, the joy that you felt at that day. The, the peace that you had that rules your heart. Remember the first time when you could pray, My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Remember how he has led you since that day. Remember the promptings of his presence. Remember the nearness to you in times of trouble. Remember his answers to your prayers. Remember his patience, his kindness, his care, his goodness to you in spite of our stubborn selfishness and hypocritical tendencies. And then, then, then look around. Open your eyes to the world. See the utter lostness of people in this world. The sin, the suffering, the hurt, the heartache. Think of their separation from God. Going through life without God, without hope, alienated with, from God, at war with God, opposed by God. Think of the suffering caused by sin, by selfishness, and the effects it has on people, on families, on communities, on nations, on the world. Think of the people you see around us, how greed, how immorality, people desperately seeking to find meaning in their life, and they seek it in all the wrong places leaving them despairing and depressed, suicidal, murderous, as in abortion and, and, and euthanasia. It leaves them confused and perplexed and lost. And they go through life without the comforter being with them, the Holy Spirit indwelling them. And remember the families... Bad marriages, broken marriages, redefined marriages. Think about families, place where there should be safety and nurture 
can be places of abuse and heartache. Havens of horror more than sanctuaries of safety. Think of our communities, just what goes on around us, the social issues that we struggle with, drug problems, alcohol abuse, gangs, prostitution, exploiting of women and children, homelessness, just name it, all effects of sin on the world. And people who are living in that needs Christ, needs hope. They need a self-savior. And we can think of nations and just what's going on in the world now. Corrupt leaders, deceiving, stealing, fighting, oppressing, sanctioning, warring. And what it affects are on people. Also consider Christ. What he has done. What he did to save the people his father gave him as an inheritance. Think of how many are still out there. The reason why we're still here is because there are still people that need to come to Christ. And he has enlisted you and me to go and call them. To seek them out. And so we need to pray and, and, and preach to reach Sinners with the gospel. Those whom he ordained to save. And God ordained, let me explain that. God ordains who will be saved. But he equally ordains the means by which he will save them. So God has decided to those whom he has chosen to be his own. But also the means, the means are prayer. The means are the gospel. The means are the Holy Spirit. The means are you and me going and testifying about Christ. So if the fire in your furnace for the lost have grown cold, confess, remember, and then act. And how do we act? We pray, we plan, we preach, and we practice. We pray for the says salvation. Don't stop praying. We, we plan. Be like Matthew. Throw a banquet. Invite your neighbors. And don't forget to invite Christ to that party. Make him central. Bring in reinforcements. Invite your friends, your grace group. Let them talk. Let them listen. And as the opportunity comes, give them Christ. Preach Christ. And then practice the love of Christ. For those who are in need of a helping hand, a practical help, help them. Be Christ to them. And when we do, and when you do, you will start to see that you, that broken, marred vessel which you think God has discarded or can't use, that there is a treasure in you. That when you bring that treasure to someone else, they may be saved. And God gets all the glory because the vessel is not all that spectacular. And so we see, we can learn from Christ, the aspects from Christ's mission, from the call of Matthew, from his concern for the lost. And now thirdly, Christ's critique of the Pharisees. Verse 11 says, And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And really the main critique that can be summarized that Jesus had against the Pharisees here is that they did not care for what God cared about. You see, the tax collectors and sinners, they were, they were defiled. They were ceremonially unclean. They were unfit company. Um, you would not let your children go there. Uh, but dining with them would have made 
Christ, Jesus, ceremonially unclean, according to the Pharisees and the scribes. And therefore, such an association raised concern in them about Christ's morals, his moral standing. But Jesus, faithful to his mission, was undeterred, and he kept on reaching out to sinners and to the moral outcasts, so much so that, that, that uh, he was accused to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Matthew 11, uh, verse 18 says, for, and this is Jesus really indicting the, those who were listening to his generation saying, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and yet they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so to be called a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners was really an accusation. It was paramount to being one yourself, having the same morals and values as they. So it was meant as an insult to Christ, that you are following an immoral man, an unworthy man, not the Christ, in other words. And Jesus responded to them with an illustration and a quote from the Old Testament prophet Hosea. And so the medical illustration, he says, it is not those who are healthy who needs a physician, but those who are sick. You see, for us today, when we are sick, we, we go to, to a doctor. We go to the, the doctor's surgery or, or we go to an hospital. Uh, not so in Jesus' day. There were no doctor surgeries or hospitals per se. And so doctors would go to the sick. Doctors would go and make house visits. And so Jesus was in effect saying that he was a doctor of the soul. He was a physician who is seeking to treat terminally sick people, terminally sick with a disease called sin. And so as a doctor of the soul, he is willing and wanting to go to where the sick was. And he was, in effect, really criticizing the religious leaders of spiritual malpractice. They were the ones, they were the spiritual leaders of the nation. They were the spiritual doctors of Israel. They were supposed to go and help these people to call them to Christ Christ. Or to faith in God. And by, by, by saying even this is that here, when it says that he did not come to, to call the healthy, he's not in indicating here that, the, that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were necessarily righteous with God. We, we understand that they were not from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, Jesus criticized them for their self-righteous attitudes and their hypocritical behavior. And so by the very fact that he quotes Hosea 6, verse 6, pointed out that they failed in their spiritual duties, their spiritual responsibility towards those who most need to know God. He says to them, go and learn. <laughs> We, we will miss that. But, you know, if, if you are a Pharisee and you have studied most of your life the Bible, and here this carpenter's son comes to you and say, go back and learn more. You, you're missing the point. You're not getting it. You claim to be righteous and you claim to know the Scriptures. Well, well go back and learn again and study some more. You're missing the point. You know, uh, later on, Jesus denounced them for, for, for tithing mint and dill and cumin, but neglecting the weightier things of law and justice and mercy. And they should have done both, because both was required. But they focused on the one, the ceremonial, the, the outside. They were so meticulous about the externals, the rituals, the ceremony, the procedures, the requirements. That they neglect justice and mercy and faithfulness. They reject compassion for others. Because things just have to be exactly as we want it to be. They did not care for what God cared about. And so go and evaluate yourself, Jesus was telling them, in light of the word of God. See, God desires compassion, not sacrifice. 
And as I said, this is a quotation from, from Isaiah, a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah. And Hosea was really confronting the nation at that time for their false religion, for their false worship, for people who were professing to worship God, people who brings all the prescribed sacrifices, who conforms to all the outward acts of religion, and yet their hearts were far from him. And so Hosea said in Hosea 6.6, 6, God desires mercy and sacrifice, the knowledge of God, so, sorry, a desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And Jesus was really in effect saying that they were not right with God themselves. Because if they were, they would have cared for what God cares about. If they were truly right with God, they would have shown mercy. They would have seek to save the lost. They would have had compassion on them because of their, the lostness of their lostness, the hopelessness of their hopelessness. And they would have taught them about God. That he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, keeping uh, uh, loving kindness for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression and sins, uh, yet will not leave the guilty unpunished. They should have gone to them and explained to them who God is. And that he is calling them back to himself. They should have told them about the blessings that the, that the covenant promises held for them. They should have told them about the curses that disobedience to the covenant held in for them. They should have called them to repentance and faith. But instead they were focusing on the out, uh, externals, the outward, the visual, the rituals of ceremony. And requirements. But God wants worshippers who worship Him in spirit and truth, not ritualistic hypocrisy. And He rebuked them further, for He says, This is what I came to do. I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. His mission was to call sinners. And of course, call here is the call to repent and believe. And so, just on a side note, the, the Pharisees were not wrong in recognizing sin in the tax collectors and the sinners. They were not wrong in condemning that. Where they failed was that they did nothing about it. That they did not reach out to them. That they did not call them back to God. They shunned them instead. They avoided them when they should have sought them to come to faith. The Pharisees focused on the externals but not the heart. And they did not care for what God cared about. So may we never be like the Pharisees. May we not become like them. Judgmental. When we condemn others as unsaved sinners, horrible people, look at what they do, look at what they approve, and yet do nothing to call them to the Lord, to call them to repentance. That we should not be indifferent, not caring, not being concerned, have no compassion, no mercy on those who have to face life without Christ now and for all eternity. That we would not be religious, focusing on the external practices, the little things that makes us Christian and that makes us somehow acceptable. And we do not care about the heart of worship. We do not care about the salvation of sinners 
or going even further, the sanctification of the saints. God sent his son to save sinners. It is a priority to him. Let us not be unfaithful to our mission, Christ's mission, which has now become our commission from him. And so this passage reminds us this morning that there are three mission aspects that we should learn from and apply. And that is we should actually call people to follow Christ. We need to speak. We need to go find them and tell them about Christ. By all means, pray for them. But also, go. And we should cultivate Christ's concern for the loss. By, again, if, you, if the, the fire in your furnace for the lost has, has doused down as burned out, then stir that up by confession and by remembering your life before Christ and now your life since Christ and the desire to share that with others. And thirdly, that we should care about what God cares, not just judging others, but actually reaching out and helping them. Let me pray for us. Father, you send your son into this world to come and seek and save us when we were lost. Lord, we pray that you would seal your vision and your mission deep into our hearts. Lord, show us how we can join you in searching for the lost. Show us how to bring them to know that they are lost and that they need a Savior and that, they, that you are that Savior. And so that they would come and repent and believe and love you as the Lord of their life. Lord, help us in that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.